This is Marketing Fundamentals with Bob. Topic one, overview of marketing. Well, here we're at the very beginning of, uh, of this course and let's kind of think about what marketing is. And we kind of, when you're starting off like this, maybe thinking of marketing in kind of narrow terms. Oh, you're thinking it's selling, it's advertising, it's promotion. Uh, maybe it's making and distributing products or creating service offerings that wind up going to your customers or channel members. But marketing is a whole lot more than that. When we use the term marketing, what we mean as a marketer, a marketing person, it's a way of thinking. It's a way of doing things. It's a philosophy of how you deal with your customers, your employees, society, and the environment through which we have the activities of the four P's. Let's see, there's your product, promotion, price, and place, that's what they are. So, probably the best place that we can uh, get started here is by kind of defining what we mean by marketing. So, to define marketing, oh dear, I'm not sure this is the American Marketing Association's definition of marketing, but hey, it's mine. It's an organized system of activities designed to get the money out of somebody else's pockets and into yours. Yes, absolutely. We're out in this business to get our objectives, but let's make a caveat on that. I'm out to get my objectives, but I'm also out to help my customer get their objectives and what they want as well. We're creating a win-win environment here, and we'll get into that later on we talk about some of the marketing ethics, but not a question about it. We know what it is that we are looking for. Now, within marketing, one of the key concepts is the concept of exchange. And when we have exchange, what we're saying as the key element of marketing, each party is going to give up something of value to get something from the other party that they consider to be of greater value. It's that simple. That's why you trade something. Uh, profit objective? Not necessarily. It does not have to be a profit objective. The only key to this thing is that each party has something that is considered to be of value to the other party, and each party is free to deal with or not deal with the other party. So, traditional example. <clears throat> you get your hard-earned money for a cold 12-pack and an on-demand movie at day's end. Yeah. <clears throat> Second possible example, um, your vote for Rand Paul or Paul Ryan or whomever to advance your own political, social, and personal interests. Mm. Third possibility, you volunteering your time to work with a public service organization. Um, yeah, well, you're doing volunteer work for whomever. You're getting a sense of uh, personal fulfillment out of it. Uh, you're getting a good line on your resume. It certainly is going to look awfully good when you go to the job interview and you can cite all the community service. So you got to trade. You're giving the time and you're getting something back in return. Um, or here's one. Been an interesting marketing campaign in recent years. Your decision to take a cab when you're, um, when you're impaired. This is mothers against drunk driving, trying to get people to think about something that 15, 20 years ago no one thought about too much. Hey, <clears throat> gonna be drinking tonight. I either need to give up the keys or take a cab or uh, basically just not get behind the wheel. <clears throat> That's a transaction, folks. At the moment that you say, I'm hanging the keys up tonight, uh, somebody else, you guys doing the driving, or you turn the keys to a friend and say, hey, I ain't doing it tonight, <clears throat> or you call a cab, that's the moment of a transaction. That's the same thing as what you might have done uh, had you purchased something at the grocery store, handing over the, over the cash to get something in return. So we really have a whole variety of contexts in which marketing takes place. Let's take a note now at the four different kinds of marketing philosophies that might be in operation. And the first one of those uh, is the production orientation. Now, the production orientation kind of started in the period post-World War II. And that was a whole different world back then, folks, because basically, uh, think about it. The U.S. was the only nation standing at the end of the war. <clears throat> All you had to do was produce a product. Somebody's there ready to buy it. And I can remember my grandfather um, in 1947, the, um, the second year the cars were being made, he gets a phone call from the local Oldsmobile dealer saying to him, hey, we got a black 1947. You want it? <clears throat> That's all you had to do back in those days. Produce a product. Someone's there. But that production orientation essentially says, what can we make? What do we do best? And so what the organization does is sets its goals and strategies 
based upon what it can most easily design and produce. So you got the Yankees and the Mets putting up their new ballparks, the attitude being, build it and they will come. What was that? Field of Dreams. Awful movie, but nonetheless. Or here's a second example. You got a logging company down here in South Alabama. Uh, what are they doing? They're planting pine trees. They're planting pine trees now with the assumption, it's probably a pretty reasonable assumption, that in 10 years, 12 years' time, there's going to be a market for those pine trees. I had one closer to home. I had a, one of my graduates in this course. Uh, she comes up to me. She's fixing to graduate, and she says, I'm going to open up a restaurant in Pensacola <clears throat> with gourmet international cuisine. And I said, well, why are you opening up a restaurant with, in Pensacola with gourmet international cuisine? And she says, because there's no restaurants in Pensacola that offer gourmet international cuisine. <clears throat> and I said, there's a, probably a good reason for that. Because in Pensacola, most people's idea of gourmet international cuisine is the Golden Corral. So no, she decides she'd open it up and it tanks and all that. But there's that attitude. This is what I can most easily design, produce. This is what I want to do. Your primary focus on a production orientation, cut your costs, uh, keep your prices low. Now, this philosophy is fine as long as product demand exceeds supply, as it was after World War II. Or today for products like crude oil. OK, we got all this oil production now going off in North Dakota. Hey, they can get the stuff out of the ground. They can pump it down to the Gulf Coast cheaper than they can bring it across the Middle East in a tanker. Hey, we can get it on scene cheaper. There's a market for it. Let's go with this. Or, as we're going to know later on, you might happen to have a differential advantage in the price and cost you have for production and, and uh, distribution. Then we have the sales orientation. Now, sales orientation, we're getting into the 50s and into the early 60s now because we've hit the end of the World War II scarcities now. People are up and producing all around. Uh, so what do I got to do? It's just not enough to produce it. Now I got to put together a sales force and aggressive tactics that push the, whatever it is that the organization can most easily produce. Uh, one of my friends uh, at the Inslee Senior Center, Martha, uh, she makes a pretty good living for herself in her retirement. She, um, she makes bird feeders that she sells in the boutique at the Ensley Senior Center. And she, she grinds out two or three of these things every week. And recently, the inventory has been kind of building up. They're not selling out as fast as she's producing the bird feeders. So what she's had to do is hire some of the fourth graders in the neighborhood to go knocking on doors and trying to move the bird feeders. Well, these kids ain't going to do it for milk and cookies at the end of the day. They want to cut. They want a commission. So what Martha's finding out is she's not making the money she used to make on those bird feeders at that particular point. Um, but with this philosophy of, um, of the sales orientation, your focus hasn't changed. You're still trying to do what you do best. But now it's how do we get rid of uh, that, that we make and do the best. So we're making the deals. You're moving the iron. Marketing orientation. Now, this comes out about the late 60s. This is a big change. When I mention that the marketing textbooks are 40 years out of date, this is it, about the late 60s, where now we have the marketing orientation, and marketing has changed now, totally changed. Now we're taking the perspective of what constitutes value in the eyes of the customer. What does the customer think they're buying? Um, in my ProSell class, it's the difference between features and benefits. Hey, people don't want deadbolt locks. They want security. You have to show them how to get security. Nobody wants a bouquet of flowers. They want love. So if you're a florist, your competition is not so much the other florists, but it's restaurants, it's people who make candy, and stuff like that, because that's what people are thinking about. Now, in all of this in marketing orientation, it's much more than the lowest price. Although price may be part of it. I like, say, Walmart. I, I happen to like to shop at Walmart. I enjoy shopping at Walmart. They got the stuff I need. The prices are good. But what really sells me on Walmart is the fact I can go in there. I can be looking for some little obscure item that's a buck and a half. I can walk up to any one of their associates there and ask them about it. They know just where it is. And most of the time, they'll take me right to it. That makes it so I can enjoy my experience at Walmart, and that's one reason I like to shop at Walmart. Now, as we go on now, 
as we get into the early 90s and on, we move to the societal marketing orientation. Now we're saying, yes, we still want to satisfy customer needs, number one, absolutely, uh, and the organization's objectives of making a profit, but now we've taken it to the next step. We're going to consider the best interests of the individual, society, and the environment. Now that, by the way, is a very thin line for, say, the alcoholic beverage manufacturers and particularly for the cigarette companies to do what's in the best interest for people. But some examples of this, um, battery companies moving toward mercury-free batteries, much better for the environment. Uh, Levi's Naturals make the jeans without chemical dyes, so more environmentally friendly. Or close to home here, we've got um, company management at the Cantonment Paper Mill. These guys are putting about a million gallons of water every year back into the Escambia River. Why wait till something goes wrong? They will establish a relationship and a dialogue with all the community leaders in the area, build a relationship, let them know they are committed to taking care of the environment. Hey, don't wait till something goes wrong to try to start up the dialogue. And by the way, today, essentially, when we say marketing orientation, that's synonymous today with a societal marketing orientation. Um, it's pretty simple, folks. It's the age of media and lawyers. You should do the right things for the right reasons, but you don't do the right things today. You got the lawyers, you got YouTube. The whole world is gonna know about it in a minute. So it just makes you sense to do the right things. Uh, in, in the marketing uh, concept then, we basically, now this is operationalizing what the marketing orientation is all about. And so I'm defining all of my company's offerings in terms of how they satisfy customers' wants and needs. And in this, all my employees, Everything everybody does in my organization is focused on customer satisfaction. Having said that, do not forget that achieving the organization's objectives of profit is absolutely as important as satisfying your customers. But you are going to achieve the best profit numbers by acting in the customer's interests at all times. Interesting story happened to me uh, that was being told to me uh, a couple of weeks ago by my neighbor Fred down the road. He, um, he was over at the uh, Home Depot there on Nine Mile Road, and he was wheeling a buggy full of a bunch of stuff, a uh, bunch of plumbing kind of material, stuff like that, up to the, up to the desk, and uh, gonna, about set to get to check out, and uh, he's got uh, about $95 worth of stuff in that buggy. And one of the Home Depot associates walked up to him and said, Ex excuse me, sir, but uh, could you tell me exactly what's the project that you're working on at home this week? And Fred says, well, I tell you, I got this leaky toilet, and it just won't stop running, so I'm getting this stuff so it'll finally shut off. And uh, the Home Depot associate says, well, sir, uh, you, don't, you don't need that. You don't need all this stuff. We have something right over here for uh, $6.99 that will take care of all that. Let me take you over there. And you're thinking, wait a second. This Home Depot associate just had a $95 sale, fixing to go to the checkout. He's now cut that down to a $6.99 sale. How long can Home Depot stay in business if they just keep cutting $95 sales down to $6.99? Yeah, a long time. They got a customer for life. And, and not only have they got a customer for life, but Fred's telling three people a day. This is what we mean by talking about always acting in the customer's interest at all times. So the bottom line to success in marketing is pretty simple, and that is provide customer value. And price is only one element, and at that, often a very small element of what constitutes total value. Also within this, what do you get for the price? Including the enjoyment of the experience and the transaction. And also, how does the customer happen to feel about uh, doing business with you and your organization? If they really don't think very much of dealing with you and your organization, uh, they're probably not gonna be too happy to do business with you unless they feel forced. But here's a real little question for you. Say you're Kraft Foods and you're marketing Maxwell House Coffee. Who's your customer? You might say coffee drinkers. No. If you're a Maxwell House and you're marketing Maxwell House coffee at Kraft Foods, your customer is Publix or Winn-Dixie or Food World. It's not the ultimate consumer. Your job 
working with the trade, if you're the rep from Kraft Foods in Maxwell House Division, your job is to help them serve their customers. You become a partner, a partnership relationship with those members of the trade. And by doing that, you're going to be someone who's taking care of them as your customers, helping them to serve their customer base. Well, this is a pretty quick one that, got, that gets us started. That's topic one. And this is Marketing Fundamentals with Bob.